In Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible reads, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. The title of our lesson this morning is very simply, Stand in Awe. And yet, it's probably the opposite of what you think it means. I mean, after all, the background is a beautiful scenery of the sky. But in reality, this scripture is written at a time when God told the prophet Habakkuk that he was going to bring the Babylonians to destroy Israel. And so the standing in awe is not a scripture that is intended to create peace and tranquility on the outside, but rather peace, tranquility, the fruit of the Spirit on the inside, even in the midst of God's wrath, trials, and difficulty. You see, the truth is, standing on the mountain after God has blessed you, that's easy. It's standing in awe in the darkest time. When the darkness compresses in on you, the lightning blinds your eyes, the thunder deafens your ears, when the rain is pouring on you, when doom seems to await you, this is the moment to stand in awe. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 14 and study out a man who stood and then later was filled with awe. In Jesus' ministry, we find an interesting time where Peter, the leader of the apostles, walked on water. And yet the context of that scripture is that Jesus sends out the apostles to preach two by two. And they have an incredibly successful missionary journey. They come back filled with joy at the success that God had given them. And yet, all the while, Jesus had to face the beheading of his cousin, John the Baptist. And so the apostles come back standing in awe because of victory. Jesus has to make a decision to stand in awe because of reverence. And so they come back and Jesus says, you know what, guys, let's just get out of here. I just want to get some time. Let's go get Buffalo Wild Wings. Let's just go get some CC. I want, I can, let's go get Bula Losa to Guy Tai. And so they go. And while they're getting ready to go, the Bible teaches that a massive multitude of people come to them. And Jesus takes the entire day. He teaches them. He heals them. He ministers to their souls. And afterward, the apostles are tired. Jesus is tired, and the apostles are ready for their rest. And yet Jesus says, we got to feed this guy. He can't meet one need and then tell them to go figure the rest out on their own. They're not even going to make it home. And the apostles have a moment of crisis. You would think at this point, they would know that Jesus deals with the impossible. They go, Eight months' wages could not feed this many people. I believe they had the money. They just didn't think it was worth the money. And so Jesus says, work with what you have. And they bring to him just a few loaves of bread, a few fish, and the Bible teaches that he multiplies it. And that day, they feed 5,000 men. And not just men, 5,000 men family head. So they fed the women, the children, likely 10,000 plus people were fed that day. And yet they came into this situation from very different places. Jesus was overwhelmed with sorrow. The apostles were overwhelmed 
with excitement. It doesn't matter how you enter into the challenge. It's how you choose to conduct yourself once you are there. And so after the people are fed, the Bible says that Jesus has to tell the apostles to go away while he dismissed so they get into a boat and they start to cross the other side of the lake. Jesus goes up to pray. See, you're not going to find rest for, for your soul in any other place than in prayer. And the Bible teaches that after being up there all night, Jesus looks down and sees the apostles after hours of rowing in the boat in a storm, not getting you may have plans to get somewhere, but only until God allows you to, will you get there. And so Jesus comes down, and this is where we pick up the story. This is the context of the story. Verse 22, it says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into a boat and go ahead of them onto the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. We just talked about it. After he dismissed them, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. There's an explanation for it right there. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the side. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came for Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me! Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. He was thinking back. You have been faith. Why? He died. And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Point number one. Stand in the storm. If you want to stand in awe, you must be willing to stand in the storm. And whether you come into the storm doing well or not well in your own mind, because well is just, it's just a fabrication of your own mind, whether you come in having victory or loss, it is a decision. And that's really the lesson of faith. Faith is a choice. Oftentimes we want to lead ourselves to believe that it's not. And that we're a victim to our circumstances. But the truth is, in any circumstance, faith is a choice. I've seen people in good circumstances choose not to have faith. And I have seen many of you in circumstances beyond what many would think you can bear. Choose to have faith. And so Jesus comes to them, and of course he says, all of Jesus' training for his apostles was never centered around him as a man. It was centered around him as what he represented. And that was to have faith in God. Everything in Jesus' ministry boils down to faith and death. And yet we look down on Peter, even though none of us here have likely ever taken a step of faith like this before, to walk on water. That's not really what matters. Because this is the process that all of us will go through if we want to plan it off. Peter sees the opportunity. You've got to give him that credit. None of the other apostles were thinking about it. He wanted to imitate Jesus. And he says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to walk on the water. Jesus says, oh. the Bible 
Because imagine that first step. And you step on solid ground. And yet, and yet, you can take that first step. You gotta be able to walk to the other side of the lake. You have to imagine that there was a storm. The Bible says that you saw the storm. No one sees the storm. No, no, what happened was that as he stood down on solid ground, most likely he felt the waters, even though he's on solid ground, he felt the wave rushing up against him, maybe knocking him over. He felt the wind in his face. He tasted the water in his mouth. And it took his focus off of Jesus. And that's all the storm was. God wants you to walk on water. But the storm needs to come to authenticate your intention. So that you can show to yourself why you're there. What is it ultimately that stops fear? Fear. Fear the not see. See, this is what the ancients were commended for. You don't think Abraham was afraid to leave the tongue down? You don't think Abraham was confused and being told to sacrifice his only son? You don't think Joshua was confused when he was defeated by Ai? You don't think these men had to face the same trials and challenges that you do? But there really is only one difference between a man who stays in step with the Spirit and the one who departs from the Spirit. And that is the one who chooses to have faith rather than in his way to fear. You see this all the time when we study the Bible and speak about this. Two people stand and they One of them becomes a disciple, the other one. Only one stands. One of them is faithful. They focus on God. The other one is taken out by the distraction by all of the things that they're afraid of. If one of them makes it, the other does it. It's not an issue of IQ, it's not an issue of circumstance. It is very simply an issue of faith. God is looking for faith inside of you. And you don't have to jump a certain height. You don't need to read a certain number of chapters. It is a decision that any one of us, regardless of all situations and backgrounds,
It was so exciting. But there were certainly a lot of unknowns. Almost everything was an unknown. The only known was the time of my life. And I, I didn't think about it. The only thing I could think about was that God was calling me to the church. And to see in that first year the send-off of the Davao mission team, the Phnom Penh mission team, to see the church grow to well over 300 disciples, it was amazing. And yet then the pandemic. And I remember in the midst of that, I, I, I didn't fixate on what was not. I just told you that was And because of that, many men rallied around and had the same mindset. You know, just up talking about Hockey in 2020 produced more than 365 videos. He worked so hard. And it was a storm. And there were many of you who stood up and were willing to stand in the storm. So that even in the midst of a pandemic, we saw the church in Baguio planted. That even in the midst of a pandemic, we saw the church grow to more than 400 disciples. Even in the midst of a pandemic, we've seen the church in the last four years grow from just over 250 disciples to now nearly 850 disciples. Because the only way to stand with Jesus is to stand in the storm. And yet, you do this when you understand where the storm comes from. Turn to John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, Nicodemus, we know Nicodemus, we know Nicodemus. Jesus is having a nice little lunch Bible study with, or an evening Bible study with Nicodemus. And he says something, a scripture we all know, but I, I saw it in a different way these last few weeks. And he says in verse 8, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born here. How can this be, Nicodemus asked? You are Israel's teacher. If you do not understand these things, I saw the scripture in a way I never saw before. The wind blows wherever it pleases. God He's going to do what God's going to do. Yeah, people will do what people will do. But God will do what people do. And yet Nicodemus goes, I don't understand. But Jesus goes, you teacher of the law, and you don't understand how God operates? How can you understand anything? You see, the man who has faith in the midst of the storm, and one simple reality that the man who doubts did not. And that is that the storm was sent by God. It was not sent by Satan. Sometimes you go, oh, I'm struggling, bro. Why, why are you struggling? Oh, just Satan's attacking me. And God says, don't call me Satan. I will take responsibility for that opportunity I afforded you. The reason you doubt and the reason you have fear is because you have come to one conclusion. God is not thinking. And the man who has faith in the midst of the storm as the, as the rain is blowing into their face and they cannot see, they're cold and they don't know where they're going. It's the man who understands the one reality. God is in control. The wind blows wherever it pleases. And if you want to finish the power that you've done, you must understand it. that you can determine your course, but it is the Lord who will determine your steps, my brother and my sister. Today, I want to challenge you to embrace the wind. Embrace the storm in your life. And when they come, remember that you have but a choice to have faith 
for fear, to have courage or to doubt. You want to stand in awe? you got to stand in the storm. For point number two, you have to be in awe of God's faithfulness. See, the Bible teaches that Jesus called out to him immediately. There's not a lot of times that the Bible uses the word immediate. There are two times that Jesus will be immediate with you. Number one, he will be immediate when he calls you. He was immediate in calling the apostles in Mark chapter 1. And he's immediate here in calling Peter out of the boat to walk on water. Maybe this morning God's calling you. And the issue is not God's faithfulness, but it's your struggling to find your faithfulness. Maybe you've been studying the Bible for some time now. I'm just not ready today. Let me give you a little news to that. You will never be ready. Because this is not an issue of knowledge. If you say, I am not ready, it means that you do know, and you've already made a choice. The problem is you've made the wrong choice. And yet, Jesus is a baby all of God is calling you right now. Yes, to stand in the storm, but to walk on water, to do things beyond what you saw. I thought of Ephesians 3.20. God has been for many more than all we ask or imagine. We oftentimes go, okay, this is my goal, and God can do even more. That's not what it's saying. It's saying you determine the course, he determines the steps. You can't conceive how he will do it. You think four weeks ago, I thought I would be moving to India? You think five years ago, I thought I'd be moving to the Philippines? That's the imagination he's talking about. God says, your story's boring. I want to spice it up. God says, walang lasa. Pero my lasa go para sa inyo. I can make this a story worth reading. And yet, God is immediate to call you. You know, I never noticed that in the scripture. He didn't walk up to him frustrated and put his hand out like this. Father. See, the Peter was plunged in the Lord saved me with the last word to have the faith I've done with him. How immediate are you to call out to God for help? Lord, save me! It's too late. Can't hear you. You need to match God's immediacy. If God is calling you, you need to respond immediately. If you're in the midst of the storm and you feel you're beginning to sink, you need to call out immediately. The Bible says that God has the best intentions for you. Second Chronicles 16, verse 9 says, The eyes of Lord reigns from the earth. He is looking to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Those who are faithful. Romans 8, 28 says, God works for the good of those who love him. Love for God is to obey his command. Jeremiah 29, verse 11 says, you will come to me and you will pray to me and I will listen to you. Jeremiah 3, 22 says, I will heal you from your backsliding. Your belly can take one step, two step back. This is a lack of faithfulness. You get scared after that first back up a couple steps. This ain't the salsa. This ain't a dance. Psalm 148, verse 10 and 11 says, God's pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of the warrior. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his un failing love. You see, when you choose to call to God for help, there is no better feeling than his comfort his love. If you catch the truth, you thought he was going to go and do it. And the way he comes to them is to tell the truth. You are only as strong as you can You know, yesterday, I uh, told 
Who are the people you keep around you? The people that will hush hush your sin, they're just going to hush hush you straight to hell. Or do you keep, 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 do you keep people around you that you want to be more with them? You know, last night, here in Austin, the news said, greatest honor to bring to the today is a patient, myself, you know, negative. If you're only as strong as you think. What I really am so proud of is, is the person they feel. They disciple one another. They call one another higher. And I am excited to go to India. But what really comforts me is knowing that those that to be in Dubai, so Mark will be here, so Carlos will go to Indonesia. I know that they have developed an impenetrable bond that Satan simply will not be able to assault. When you make a decision to be immediate in God's comfort, He will transform you in ways you never could have imagined. And I know this, not because I've seen it in others, but I've seen it in the Bible. I've seen it in my own life. You know, we share, oh, the, you know, the, 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 the 42. I was able to be on the mission team to L.A. Let me show you what I looked like when I moved to L.A. That's me. Uh, Uncle Jen. That's not Justin Bieber. That's Ricky Chalinor. But I was able to grow because of the people in my life. Let's see the next picture. Oh, that was me. I want to be a leader. Thank goodness for Colleen, amen, and Tony and Therese. Oh, there's one more. Oh! You guys go, oh yeah, Tim's awesome. He helped Ricky. No, no, guys. That's what he had to work with. And yet, it's through discipling and partnership that you find transformation. But it, it's not, it's not just me, guys. I'm so proud of the brothers and the transformations that they've had. As the Lord is my witness, that is Zach Shields on the left. From a kid to potentially a criminal. Look at the change. That's not all. Look who else. There it is. There it is. First song you learn. We are soldiers. And look at Carlos about to bring the gospel to an entire nation. And yet now my, my right hand man to be. Look at this one. It ain't a joke. Here's the thing. That was post baptism. It was worse before. And yet you look at how far they've come. Because of the helping hand of God. You know, when I landed here in 2019, that was the whole staff we had to work with. And yet, just this morning, even without the Carbonells, we were able to take this photo to see the transformation in people's lives. You see, God has a plan for you. There's a plan for you. And yet I want to challenge us. That plan comes into reality when you take your relationship with God higher and to deeper levels. you got to make a decision. Today I will transform so that I won't die in the storm. At the end of Mark, or Matthew chapter 14, the Bible teaches things to tend to weigh guys down. Why? Because he didn't stop the storm. He was the storm. And as soon as they land, what happens? That same group of people who just had dinner want breakfast. They wanted they wanted some tocino. You see, 
see, the reality is they land on the other side, and the mission continues. So here's the thing. God cares. He cares about how you do it. But the world and the mission doesn't. I appreciate so much, Father. His father died. And the day after the funeral, he had to stand in the storm and be an object patron and preach the faith of his ministry. But let me say it again. God cares how you're doing. Hey. First Thessalonians 5 20 says God's will to be right. It's for you to be joyful. That's what he wants. He wants you to have life to the full. God cares so much. He sent his son to die on the cross for your sins. But don't think for a, a second that that means that the world cares. Don't think that that means that your ministry is going to care. Because there will always be a need. These last four years have been the best years of And I love each and every one of you so much. I'm so proud of you. And I'm honored to have been a part of your story. But the story goes on. And it's a story where you must decide to stand in the story. It is a story that you must decide to be in awe of God's faithfulness. It is a story in which you will choose to stand in awe. Brothers and sisters, just know that forever it has been our fault. And no, mommy me spoke a yo. But never forget, brothers and sisters, Mahalko Kayo. To God be the glory.